Welcome to the Eastman Dental Podcast, where we hope to inspire, motivate and provide education from our guests' experience. This week, Steve Campbell is joining Josh and I, talking about his career journey. Steve has worked as a dental technician for over 25 years, providing all aspects of restorative dentistry with a particular focus on implants. I suppose my career pathway shows it. It's really accessible. Anyone can become a technician. So you don't have to have got the best grades at school. You can work through an apprenticeship and you can work through assisted courses to get yourself onto that college course. His passion for dental technology has evolved over this time and he opened and began to run his own fully digital dental laboratory in 2015. In addition to his business, Steve is an executive committee member for the British Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry and he's also the current president of the Dental Laboratories Association. And when you see somebody who's lost form and function get it back, it is humbling. I, I've, I've many a time, I've sat and thought, wow, we really did that. So it's great to have you on the podcast um, today and we can't wait to get a bit more of an insight into dental technology. With your hosts, Josh Hudson and Julia Bruin. Uh, we would like to go back to the start of your career, but I think um, what we have identified from talking to various people is that sometimes people didn't even know what their career choice necessarily was uh, before they started um, really training. So tell us a little bit about dental technology and how you got into it. Yeah, do you know, I think that's exactly it. I, when I was at school, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I really had no clue, but I was very lucky. I had a careers teacher who, he was watching me with what I wanted or what I was enjoying uh, and pointed me towards going to be a dental technician. And I had no idea what that was, not a clue. So he pulled me to one side and he said, I know you like engineering. I know you like doing things technically, but you know, I don't think you've got what it takes to go through, through university and become an engineer, engineer. And I was like, okay, that hurts. Yeah. He said, but I've, um, I've got a very good friend who runs a dental laboratory and I think you would enjoy being a dental technician. He sent me across, I walked into the room. It was crazy. It was, there was so many people running around. There was pots of boiling in the corner with these big brass flasks. There was wax everywhere. It was mayhem, but I fell in love with it. Within the first two days, I was like, you're right. After that week of work experience, I just, I said, yes, I want to be a dental technician. I'd never heard of it, but it just, it just grabbed me. It really did. Uh, and it's interesting where that's taken me. So that's where it started. So where did it go from there? So you went on that work experience and then how did you end up becoming a dental technician after that? So I went back and um, I asked if they'd mind taking me on as an apprentice. And he said, yeah, come back. When you've finished, you come back here and we'll take you on. And that's exactly what happened. I went in uh, on a Monday morning. He just sat me straight down and he said, okay, we're going to talk. He only talked to me for about 15 minutes about what I was going to have to do and then put me in the plaster room because that's where everybody started. Mm -hmm. It was casting straight away. Uh, and that was it. It was just there was no big preamble. There was no, he didn't know inspiring story of what we were gonna be doing. It was like, you will start here and I will see if you're fit for the job and we may keep you on, you know, in the next two, three weeks, we'll see. And I had to go through all that time thinking, oh, I hope I get, I hope I get the job. <laughs> I hope they keep me on, I hope they keep me on. Um, and, and they did. Uh, and then as most technicians do, you then prove your worth and you're let loose on the next thing and the next thing. Uh, so I worked my way through the basic low stages, copings, production, frameworks. Now at that time, um, which surprises quite a lot of people, that there, there was a college release course, but I didn't get to go on that. I did a full apprenticeship. So I was just, everything was at the laboratory. So I kind of did all the hands-on first, then I had to go away and I learned myself. The more I wanted to do, the more I had to rely on reading books. So when I was getting into implants, I had to read White's book. And then I had to learn how to do these things, why certain things were happening. I had to then learn the science behind it to make sure that practically I could deliver. Um, and that's probably my only regret, if I'm honest. I wish I had had the full education experience because I think that's 
really the most important bit. When I see technicians, if you understand why things are happening, especially now, there's so much at play with chemistry and the things that they're going to have to deal with in these coming years, it makes a big difference to what you can deliver. Um, but I had to learn on the go, which, you know, it's been great for me anyway, but I do wish- It doesn't wish sound as though it's again. held you back. <laughs> it, no, it hasn't, luckily enough. It's allowed me to <laughs> still carry on and do what I needed to do. So is that an option now to do a full apprenticeship style or is it kind of a college course or how, how would you get into dental technology these days? So to be a dental technician these days, you can either do a full time course mm. at college, then you'll complete the full time ed you know, education course, then you'll find a placement or you do a part time. So you'll work in the laboratory four days a week and then you'll spend a day at the hospital and that's where you'll learn all of the, the key science behind what you're doing really uh, and that's the mode that we're seeing a lot more technicians taking at the moment they are getting a position and working their way through and spending a day uh, and i think that's probably that's probably quite a good balance because we are seeing at some of the some of the education institutes unfortunately they're not getting the support and funding so they can't teach the latest techniques. They can't get the digital tools in there that are going to be absolutely crucial for these technicians coming into the marketplace. I know from my own lab, you know, when we started six months, six years ago, going completely digital, at that point it was borderline if we could really do everything digitally, but we've just left away from a Congress this weekend and every technician is working solely digitally. I think we'll be the last generation that will remember working so intensively with wax manual techniques yeah. the the people who are coming behind us they'll never have had that experience they'll only be digital and i think it's going to be key that we have to support those education institutes and make sure that they have that funding and support so we've reached out to um exacad three shape the software development teams and said why is there not an education dongle why is there not a way that they can at least train on these tools mm. so that when they come out they can do it it's the 3d printing companies why are you not providing a printer because once they know those skills they'll utilize your yeah. materials and equipment when they come through um, so i think it's going to be crucial that we do that so i just want to backtrack a little bit there so it seemed like you were kind of thrown into the deep end a little bit in the start of, of your career and i just want you to think back to those days and i wonder how you describe those days if you're going to use three words that to describe the, the start of your dental technology career? Manic, <laughs> exciting, stressful. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the stress levels were super high, super, super high. Uh, we worked very long hours, but it was expected. It was a culture. You know, there, there was this expectation that no matter what it took, you would make sure that work was in that practice for that appointment. And that's no bad thing because we are obviously making medical devices. There's a patient at the end. Mm -hmm. There's a huge expectation that you need to make sure that that patient leaves yeah. with that restoration. But with it came a lot of stress because the hours were very long. Because if I look at it now, I know why they were so long. It's because there was so much manual post-processing involved in making a prosthesis. It was intense, really labor intensive. I mean, when I look at it now, I'm just like, how did we even do it? Some of these things are very highly technically skilled and they take a lot of manual processing. So it's, it's easier now. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, but it is easier because now we can apply our knowledge and our abilities. But we can let the machinery and materials help us in a way we just couldn't do in those days. It didn't exist. There was, there was no way to have these things go from a concept, a design, to a produced unit without in the mid doing a, a lot, lot of, of yeah, a lot of stages and many stages where it could go wrong. <laughs> yeah. I think that's really interesting actually that you should say stressful because I think certainly a lot of clinicians will, um, that will resonate with in terms of a stressful career. But I don't know, that lab work arrives on the day for the appointment, like you say, and the thought of there's somebody behind that that's going through a stressful, you know, like you say, things go wrong and they're getting that to you on that day. And maybe people don't think about that aspect when they're, they're you know, prescribing their lab work. They don't think that there's somebody potentially stressed at the end, making sure it comes on the right day. So I think it's important that, you know, people think about that and they don't necessarily, you know, think 
this needs to be done by this day at all costs and they don't think about the person behind it. So I think it's interesting that you said, said that stressful element. Oh, it is. I mean, don't get me wrong. Not all stress is terrible stress. You know, there, there was a certain amount of excitement and exhilaration yeah. with that stress. It kept you on your toes. Um, but there were moments when you're like, oh, this is not going to work. You know, you know it's the game counting down literally to 30 minutes to go. And you're like, it's coming out the furnace. Please don't be broken. Please don't be broken. And it wasn't broken. And you're like, oh, you run downstairs. Yeah. It's done. It's finished. Um, but, you know, I think that's one of the things that, if I'm honest, that it's what kept me going. You know, that, that it, you get a rush out yeah. of being part of that team and delivering on time. Uh, and knowing that what you're doing makes a difference. I mean, yes, we all should think more about everyone else in the team, but it's kind of hard really because really a good technical team work effectively in the background. So you don't have to think about yeah. it. That's really the key. You should take it for granted it will be there because the patient doesn't even know we exist. <laughs> so, you know, it really wouldn't be the thing. Most of the yeah. time it comes and if it's not right, who's going to get it in the neck? The dentist and the nurse, whoever's yeah. in that room. Yeah, we're, 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 hidden, we're, we're hidden in the back room. You'll get it in another, in another yeah, Oh yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get an upset phone call. <laughs> But you get it in the neck from, you know, and, and off, now often we've got to remember in the lab, and I try and make everyone remember this, we're quite lucky we don't deal with patients because patients come with their own certain set of challenging Definitely. expectations sometimes. Managing that is a hard job. So we always try and remind them, look, it, it's not a case of, oh, yeah, it doesn't but you're, get there. You're, you're managing the clinician, not you? <laughs> <Which sort laughs> no, of, I think a different person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, well, if it doesn't get there on time, somebody like, oh, we'll just reschedule. No, you won't, because that patient has been ramping up to that appointment mm. and they want to get it done. And when it's not going to happen, they can get very, very upset. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you've sort of said several things there, um, a little bit about the stress of um, times gone by. And you also talked about the fact that you have developed your own fully digital laboratory six years ago. So, I mean, six years ago, that was a big change. Do you think your stress levels are, are, are different? I mean, talk us through what problems that you have associated with running a fully digital lab. So when we compare the analog laboratory and digital laboratory I have now, the stresses are different. The old stresses were more to do with processes, workflow, would it be consistent? Because it didn't always fit. Things weren't always the same. Because in manual processing, there are many, many steps. And if one thing goes wrong, you get error stacking. The next thing's wrong, the next thing's wrong, the final thing's wrong. Yeah. I don't worry about those anymore. Everything now is very, very consistent. But our biggest problem is information. You know, how do we get that information? And it's normally very fragmented. So we're getting what When you say when you get the information, yeah. you're talking about when it comes to the laboratory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, not, you know, the intraoral scans or we still take a lot of traditional impressions come in and we'll digitize them. So that bit of it's still the same. But what isn't the same is what we need now or what we ask for is a lot more information. We want facial photographs because that allows us to analyze and make sure we align our prosthesis properly. We need sometimes CD data when we're working on implant cases, as we do quite a lot. And all of these have to come to us normally in different information channels. So I've got people who are sending me files through several different platforms and it can get very stressful knowing where everything is, trying to get it into one area. And then when you come to digital workflows, there's just so many to choose. You've got different CAD software programs that might work or not work with you. Then you've got surgeons using different implant planning softwares, some of which play nicely with the CAD software and some of which don't. Mm. So it's this digital fragmentation yeah. has become our biggest stress now. We need to make sure we simplify this down so that it's one information channel where we keep all the information in one central point. And I know this company's working on that right now. I think you kind of alluded to it there, that the technology's moving quite fast. I'm sure over the last six years, it's probably completely changed. And people are using different things. People are, like you said, sending information in different formats. And I think from a clinician point of view, I've got, you know, my systems that I know, but you have to know all the systems because everyone's using different things. How do you keep up to date when there's all these new materials, new products, new computer software? How do you keep up to date when it's changing so quickly? You just have to go to every possible meeting and study club you can. And that's the honest truth. I mean, look, I, I, I've always been a bit of a nerd anyway. I love technology. I love something new to work with and play with. But the, the truth of the matter is 
you have to go to the local study clubs. You have to go and, and talk with your surgeons, the hygienists, the nurses. We were just at a big Congress this weekend. It was every member of the dental team in that Congress. And that's the key because we all learn from each other. We can't possibly alone keep up to date with all the trends, materials. So there's some people there who were talking about material we'd never looked at before, but because they've spent a lot of time on it and now have a lot of data on it, we can be confident that I'll try that now. I've seen the positive. That for me was, was key really, because I think we've, when it comes to consistency, we've got that now. We've nailed that. We know exactly how that all works. I think the new challenges are materials. And actually, are you making a prosthesis that's fit for purpose? You know, this particular meeting, we were highlighting how we don't engage with the hygienists enough. We are making some prosthesis that are going in people's mouths. Can they maintain them well enough? Are we designing them well enough that they can maintain them well enough? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the biggest challenge. We've now got to rethink what we do. With the new materials, we can make virtually everything. But are we making it fit for purpose? Really? And I was quite shocked. You know, I had a hygienist friend show me some of the things that she's had to deal with that yes. we as technicians have made. <laughs> and it's quite frankly Well, wrong. actually, let, let's let's not give you all of the blame because actually somebody had to fit that too. No, they did. But also, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I agree. But, you know, we made it. Uh, and more and more, that's exactly what we're saying at this conference why would you make it? If, if you know it's wrong, why would you make it? But I think what really came to the fore was we didn't know we were making it wrong. Do you mm, know why? Yeah. We never spoke to a hygienist yeah. who said, yes. look at the underside of this. Why would you do this to me? You know, it, it's, it's, it's great that I hear you say this because I, I've had many, many patients over the years that I've seen that I've said to them when they're about to have a new bridge or, you know, various bits of reconstruction in their mouth and I've said to them all just make sure that when you go and have it fitted you say to the dentist who's fitting it for you oh I will be able to get my this in I will be able to floss around it I will be able to do this and they go oh yeah that's a good point and I say it sounds much better if it comes from you <laughs> <laughs> whether it sounds coming from from me so um yeah I, I i really resonate with your point there about the fact that that's that's obviously quite a big change because in 27 years if you'd said to you 27 years ago are you having a conversation with your colleague who's a hygienist you probably would have said no well no no because at that point genuinely they were we were kept completely separate from each other you know a technician worked only to the prescription of the surgeon and made at the desk, what they thought was good. And yeah. the, the focus was always make it look pretty. If it looks great, it's not coming back. And that's where we saw mm. these uncleansable flanges, et cetera, come from. So yes, I know we can say it's everyone in the team, but actually it was pretty much about that because of that first looking at it like, oh yeah, I, I like that. And then they go. Yes. I think now, especially with new technology, it's so cheap for me to just mill out a PMMA trial the patient can go and wear that for a month and they can come back and they can report to the surgeon, to the hygienist and say, yeah, I can manage this. Or actually, no, I don't like the feel of this. And we can then adapt all that information, and then make the final. And you'd only be able to get that sort of try before you <laughs> finally decide with the advent of um, digital technology? You could always do it. The difference was we couldn't do it cost effectively. There was a lot of man hours and labor involved right. in making every prosthesis. Now I have the designs. I will literally produce it in a very, you know, robust but cost effective graphene PMMA. And then once we get the go ahead, then we'll transfer it over to a full final prosthesis, which might be a titanium substructure with another material. It could be any combination of materials. But the key is the patient got the opportunity to trial it without any huge expense. This really was the biggest thing. Of course, we could always do it in the past, but with all the hours needed to make anything come out of a lab, it was probably gonna be quite expensive to go down that path. Now, what digital should be doing is bringing more treatments to everybody because we're hopefully gonna break down the cost barrier. So you're president of the Dental Laboratories Association. How, how did that come about? How did you end up in that position? <laughs> Do you know, um, that, that really is interesting because 
I'm still amazed that people trust me with that role. I I remember speaking to um, the president of the Dental Bar Association many years ago, and I said to him, how do you ever get to the position where you are trusted for this role? Mm. And he laughed and said, well, one day you'll you'll do it. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> it, was, it was David who said this to me. I was like, no, that's never going to happen. But it did happen because I think as you start to work more and we go to meetings a lot more, somebody then likes what you what you stand for or what you're saying and thinks actually that's probably not a bad message for us as a an, as a group uh and that's really how it happened i was approached at a trade show i was just walking around and they said look steve we'd like you to consider coming onto the the dla i was like oh yeah i'd be honored so i went in doing information first mm-hmm. you know so it was information promotion helping them go and as we had more and more meetings slowly but surely <laughs> they were like maybe you might want to be the secretary maybe you want to be the president and i took it on i was like look it's t- it's a two year term of course i'd be honored i'll do it uh, in my two year term they changed it to five years <laughs> <laughs> because that was the chief dental officer's term it changed to five years so we're like right we have to keep you guys matched well that's probably no bad thing really with continuity and the speed at which dental technology has been going through a change well dentistry as a whole but certainly your field has changed dramatically yeah no i I agree the the continuity was definitely a good thing my wife did not agree (laughs) (laughs) because you know with everything we do there's an extra time commitment that comes with it Mm. yeah so i got to the end of my five-year term and they asked me to stand again and i said well of course i'll stand again thinking look did you ask your wife (laughs) I actually didn't. <laughs> oh. I really didn't because I didn't think I'd get it. You know, I thought I'll stand again just to be the backdrop. So, you know, if someone else comes in, I think it's going to be good for the industry because I don't actually think it's a good idea to have somebody in the same position for too long because it can get a bit stale. So I was kind of hoping that I would get beaten. <laughs> and unfortunately, it seems that whatever I've been doing, I've done well enough not to upset too many people. So they've let me stay on again. Um, so I've got three more years left, as long as I don't do something terrible. <laughs> so are you working on any exciting projects at the moment? Yeah, the most exciting project uh, is about um, inspiring and engaging. We know, as an industry, we're in big trouble. There were 72 technicians joined the register in 2020 and over 300 left. There is a huge decline in the technician workforce and we've got to start looking at ourselves and saying, well, why? Why are we not engaged and inspiring? So we're going to work with the the Science Museum in London. They're going to put on an installation and the idea is to bring children from schools to show them the work we do. And it's not just us, it's going to be other members of the dental team. It's going to be other technicians from other areas. So there'll be audiology technicians showing the work they do. And the idea will be they get to see what can, they could possibly do in the future. Because the one thing I will say is, I suppose my career pathway shows it, it's really accessible. Anyone can become a technician. So you don't have to have got the best grades at school. You can work through an apprenticeship and you can work through assisted courses to get yourself onto that college course and I think if we can just get the right people in and show them the future they could have we will actually solve our own um, staffing crisis because there's no job quite like the job that we do as the team Mm -hmm. and I mean all of us here we change lives I mean Look, I know when someone makes a great product, they change someone's life in a small way. It's more of a comfort or convenience way, but we actually restore form and function. And it's incredible, really. Yeah. So it's, it's, not, it's like, if it's I a can privilege. come from nothing privilege, yeah, yeah. and get to there, normally you would only think, you would only trust, oh, you'd have to be a highly educated So It's like, no, you can be such a worthwhile member of this team. So I, I think that's our biggest project. It's we want to make sure that we're fit for future purpose and we've realized that i think we've all probably been too busy running around trying to make all the prosthesis and not realizing our numbers were dwindling just as fast as they were yeah Yeah. and we're now realizing we're in trouble because there's only just over five thousand technicians left now and the average age of the uk technician is 58. that's an average 
that's shocking. Yeah, that's I, crazy. Yeah, it's the only party I'm young at. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, you know, I'm looking at this thinking, we're in trouble then because- But you do get average. invited to lots of parties, so that's all right. <laughs> I do get invited to lots of parties, <laughs> yeah, I do. But it's, um, I think if we look at that average age, where are we gonna be in five years? Yeah. We're in trouble. So we've got to act now. So I think That these... sounds a really interesting initiative and probably something that is a huge project, but I hope it, something comes out of that. that... Yeah, I, I really do too. I mean, they, they seem very, very keen. Uh, hopefully we, we make this happen. Well, a, a key part of this podcast and all of these episodes that we're creating is to inspire people, to motivate people and to share education by speaking to different people about their experiences. And I think fr from what from what you've said there about you know the numbers dwindling, there's a couple of different things. And I think one of those aspects is gonna be retention of people that we've already got. So I think if there's people that are listening, dental technicians that may be in a bit of a rut and they're you know, maybe not happy with, with, with where they're at, what advice would you give them? What would you say to them to you know, inspire them to maybe do something differently that would make them a little bit more fulfilled in their career? This is going to sound because I'm known as a digital dental technician, like such an obvious thing to say, but digitize your lab and do it now. Because what we realized is it takes away a lot of the monotonous tasks. And what we're actually engaging more and more with now is design, working with exciting materials, working more in collaboration with our surgeons because we share all the stuff we're doing with our surgeons through 3D web viewers. We have more feedback we can pick up things a lot sooner than we used to. And actually it's, it's changed everything about how we work. It's become a lot more rewarding. It was, it's always been rewarding, but there's nothing rewarding about sat down polishing 50 gold crowns. I can tell you, <laughs> having no fingerprints is not particularly rewarding. And this is really what I'm trying to say to people like, look, use your minds, use your talents, use what you are great at, and let's drop the manual labor it's transformed my business. You know, I, I started with only three technicians and within within a year, we were doing the same volume of work as a 22-man laboratory I'd left. And that showed me that this is a very powerful tool. Yeah. And if we're losing technicians, we need to utilize that to try and compensate for the loss until our longer term plan kicks in, which is how do we inspire people leaving school to yeah. come in? That's and I think the, the Science Museum initiative sounds just a, a perfect way to, without wishing to sound cheeky, get hold of those geeks. <laughs> yeah, 100%. You know, it just to open their eyes. Yeah. I mean, like when you go in. No, you're opening my eyes, believe me. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm very inspired by your conversation. And I have to tell you, I'm, I'm not a great expert on dental technology and least of all fully digital laboratories. So I am agog of what I'm listening to. <laughs> So I think that's one aspect of things is getting those technicians out of that rut, so to speak. And um, the other thing that obviously we've already talked about is getting new people to join. So what advice would you give to somebody who's, you know, maybe a school leaver, maybe somebody that wants a complete change of career, who's thinking about getting into dental technology? What advice would you give to them? My advice would be, please get involved <laughs> because I'm telling you now, we've had people who've come to us and didn't realize what they're going to be working with powerful CAD systems, global partnerships. We have things machined and milled in Hazelt, in San Sebastian. We operate with those teams on a daily basis, but now we've got these 3D printers in the lab and these things are amazing bits of kit. You design it and you literally watch these things coming out of a resin bath. We're seeing now with carbon, 3D dentures that are stronger than any denture we've done in the past. So it's you're gonna have all these toys to play with. You're gonna work in a really good team. You know, I, I, in the early days, my interaction with a surgeon was very much one prescription, make this and have it here for this day. Yeah. That was it. It's not like that anymore. You know, I, we truly collaborate. We have conversations, we're part of the planning. And with the hygienists, we do get this. We get this follow through, the treatment coordinators are now helping us by, look, we really need this photograph, can you get it? So, well, they'll take care of it because the surgeons are flat out busy in the surgery. You have a very similar problem. The demand is sky mm. high. The hygienists are busy, your books are full. Treatment coordinators, these are the roles that are now gathering information. So my only advice is, please don't go off and work designing the next new 
gadget and toy, it's fine. Yeah, someone will enjoy it for a six month life cycle till the new gadget comes out. Mm -hmm. But your work, if you come into dentistry and dental technology, will literally change someone's life. It will be there all through their life. I'm trying to make people aware you're gonna make a difference in a real tangible way. And when you see somebody who's lost form and function get it back, it is humbling. I, I've, I've many a time I've sat and thought, wow, we really did that. Yeah. And that's powerful. That's where we need to be getting people. We need to get them emotionally. They're gonna have the best time ever, but we've got to get them involved emotionally and realize you're gonna change lives. That's how we're gonna do it. I can guess what the answer to this question <laughs> might be, but I'm still gonna ask it anyway. <laughs> Do you think there's anything in the dental industry or the dental world we should all perhaps start doing or stop doing? I mean, you, you, you can choose whether you're a starter or a stopper, but, <laughs> you know, is there anything that you feel that we could be doing or not be doing anymore? Uh, we need to stop putting ourselves down. We need to stop not thinking that we matter. That's what we need to stop. Okay, I think we've, if we start to really really stand up and say, look, we make a difference. We add a lot of value to society as our group. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, generally in the UK, I really don't believe patients ever really valued it as much as they should. You know, yeah. I know, you know, how, come on, you're a dentist. How many times <laughs> do people sit in the chair and say, don't like dentists? Yep. You know, they, <laughs> the first thing they say to you, don't like yeah. dentists, I don't like being here, I don't like this. It's in the, it's the same for hygienists, by the way. I, 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 I 100% <laughs> get it because they know you're going to tell them off for not flossing enough. <laughs> I have this conversation when I go. I'm using those little um, teepee brushes more now because I, I feel like I'm going to get told off by the headmistress. <laughs> <laughs> like, like you want, I, you have not been flossing. I know you haven't. But it's it's not something where we. I don't think we really have stood up and owned it enough and said, look, we are an amazing part of society what we do has real value that would be what i'd say stop putting ourselves down start being proud of what we do and i think the key to that is we've got to look after ourselves you know it's about self-respect but it's we've got to be very careful everybody's very aware now of mental health issues and we talked about stress at the beginning yeah. this super super high stress you know the whole team we all know it um it's it's shocking the, um, I don't, almost don't want to say it, but I'm going to say it. The, the, the suicide numbers are, are very high in veterinary, doctor, and dentistry. Why is that? You know, it must be because we're under immense stress. Yeah. So something needs to be fixed on that front. We need to look after ourselves. I'm delighted to say, though, I really do think things are changing. Oh, on oh that they front. are changing. I mean, and for every for every profession. I mean, we're lucky enough. We happen to be having some trailblazers who are talking about mental health in dentistry. But I, I think generally people are more attuned to that, which we are, which I think is a, is a comfort. But like you say, dentistry is quite high up on the list, isn't it? But because you know, we all work in isolation, really. I know we're meant. You know, we work together in collaboration to provide something, but we actually do work in isolation. You'll be in your clinic by yourself. You're in your clinic by yourself. I'm in my lab by myself. It can become quite isolating. And I think this is why with digital, we are actually communicating more. We're collaborating more. Being part of that team is more tangible than it ever used to be. So I think that helps. It's about support. It really is. And, and this is what we can do with these tools. We can support each other better as well. 100%, I definitely agree. And I think with um, all aspects of digital, I mean, you can pick up the phone, speak to your laboratory technician, you can both have a photo in front of you and be talking through things. And I think it's really important that as a team, we all do communicate more. Like you were saying about talking to hygienists that you might never have done before. And I think it's it's really important that, you know, we champion that and that we, we push forward with that. Sorry, do you mind if I just add something yeah, to that? Of course. Might be a bit controversial, but I would like to also change the way we do do this treatment. I would like to design the prosthesis, send the patient away, and I'd like the hygienist to review it. So the hygienist talks to the patient because patients often don't actually communicate as well with, with the dentist. I don't know if it's a fear thing, mm -hmm. but they'll say a lot more to a treatment coordinator. But if a hygienist gives it the green light, we know it's then good to go and fit because these are gonna be in there with the new materials conceivably for 20 years plus, you know, these full art structures. And I think, why don't we 
change the pathways a little bit because we can now we have yeah. different ways of doing things but it's not we still does not the way we work it goes it goes back to the surgery then we'll get the all clear then it'll come back so maybe we could throw that in there a little bit of a change we can change workflows now we've got new ways of working nothing the matter with that i'm <laughs> totally in favor of all of that yeah 100 percent nurses as well i, th I know 100%. colleagues that make an excuse to leave while they're trying in a prosthesis because they know that the patient's going to tell the nurse what they actually think while they're out the room. So that's amazing. Um, that's exactly what one of the nurses said to me at this conference at the weekend. Yeah. The surgeon makes a point of making an excuse to leave for five minutes and then the nurse will just give them time and they'll be like, how do you feel about it? Da, 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 and then they'll just tell them. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas in the past, they're always like, oh no, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. They go. <laughs> so yeah, you're absolutely right. So yeah, let's utilize the whole team a lot more. So right at the start, we asked you the three words that describe the early stages of your career. And I'm interested to know what three words would describe your career now. Are they still the same or have things changed? No, they've changed. Uh, my three words now are exciting, engaging, fulfilling. You know, I, the stress isn't the issue it was before. Mm -hmm. It is a lot more excitement because I can, I know, I'm very lucky I work in some of the beta testing programs. I see the tools that are coming, I see the materials that are coming. And I think this is going to be just so incredible to watch what happens in the next five years. There's things coming that we didn't even think of in the past. And I would say that it's engaging because now we are really engaged with what we do. We've got the opportunity to do more than we ever did. And it's fulfilling because we actually see a lot more of the patients than we did before. We get a lot more post fit photos mm. and that's really it for me so it's changed in in my short career so far hopefully i'll hang around a lot longer <laughs> you know i walked in a room with boiling pots the like brass pots boiling out dentures mm. and now i work in a design studio with 3d printers and a cad team it's just a paradigm shift I, if you showed me the laboratory then and now I wouldn't believe it. It's yeah. like the, they have no relationship to each other. And that's kind of, I feel like I've been fortunate really, because I'm almost the guy that lived through the invention of the light bulb. <laughs> I've, I've now seen something that the new wave of technicians will never see. Yeah. They won't work in the way I ever worked. So, thankfully. I mean, you, you've you just sort of said what you think sort of things are now and such a, a change from what you were doing, but yeah. I mean, crystal ball yourself in you know in a decade from now do you think everybody will go digital a hundred percent it's going to have to happen and you know the ar vr that's about to come to the, the the team is incredible and it's i was talking to somebody it was a recent lecture about the exponential curve and like you say the crystal ball we're really bad at because we compare ourselves to the experience we've seen in our time so we might have just thought in the past how would you do it? Oh, I'd have a, a better boiling out flask. Because yeah. you think of the same process. Yeah. So when you ask me what it's gonna be like in the future, the honest, I have no clue, but I know it's going to be completely transformed. The next big thing we're seeing is the AR VR. You know, we're seeing people working in in the surgery Just with the augmented, overlay, we've augmented got. reality. It's incredible. Mm. It's incredible. So yeah, I can't predict the future. Because I would just probably think, oh, better software tools, better materials. It would be nothing like that. That's the exciting thing. That's great. Thank you so yeah, much. It's you. been it's... really, really great having you part of this project. It's incredibly refreshing. I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, like you mentioned, technicians leaving. There's a lot of, you know, worry in that aspect. But it seems like there's so much exciting things that are coming forward as well. So I think it's really nice to have that conversation about both aspects so thank you so much for joining us and, and i would just like to thank you both for the fact that you put this podcast together because it's exactly what you're talking about it's engagement and education if people can hear this and think do you know what i'm going to go into dentistry who'd never thought of it then that'll be the best thing any of us can do so i i thank you very much for having me on and i think this is a great project it's been a pleasure having you on board thank, thank you, you so much we hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode we would love to hear your suggestions for future guests. Remember to follow us on social media using hashtag the Eastman Dental Podcast. And if you like what you hear, please like, share, subscribe and listen out for future episodes. Mm -hmm.